Great. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Matt Russell with the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, really pleased to have Brian Schwingle with the Minnesota DNR here today uh, to talk about Forest Health. But before we get started, uh, for those of you that are watching online, I wanted to orient you to the WebEx system. Uh, you should be seeing Brian's slides, Forest Health Trends and Phenomena from 2018. Uh, Brian will go through those slides. On the side of the WebEx system, there should be um, uh, a list of the people presenting and then the chat area. Uh, so I really encourage you to ask questions and to provide comments in that chat area. Um, and so you can do that throughout the presentation as Brian is presenting. Uh, and I'll be here monitoring um, what questions and what comments are coming through. Uh, so I really encourage you to use that chat area uh, and we'll relay those questions to Brian. And I think Brian usually will have a convenient stopping point or two in the, in the presentation to take questions. Um, as they come in. I do want to point you also to, uh, this is the first webinar in our 2019 uh, forestry webinar series offered by SFEC and Extension. Um, and I'm sure one of us will share a link with you uh, that lists all those webinars uh, that we've got uh, scheduled for at least the first half of the year. Uh, we'll be sure to send a link to that uh, in the chat area sometime before the webinar ends. And so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Brian. Brian is a forest health specialist uh, with the Minnesota DNR. Uh, and as I understand, it has some new colleagues working with him, uh, which I think he'll tell us about too. Um, and so this has become kind of an annual presentation that Brian gives, um, and it's really one of my favorites. Well, not only because I work in Forest Health, uh, but also because it's really kind of the pulse of what's happening in Minnesota. Uh, so Brian's going to talk about the trends and phenomena from 2018 and things that he's been seeing uh, related to Forest Health across Minnesota. So Brian, take it away. Thanks, Matt. That was a very nice introduction. I've never been associated with the Pulse before. That's pretty cool. And I, I want to thank the live audience for coming. It is so much easier to talk to real people than to nobody. So thanks. Um, so I'm trying to expand my slide here. What do you need to see? I'm trying to move move this move to the next slide We're having some technical difficulties already i think this happened last year too all right thanks matt okay so i'll start off by describing our new team so uh my my previous counterparts in northeastern and northwestern minnesota left in early 2018 or yeah, 2018 for um, greener pastures for them. So we're all happy for them. And we hired and they started last week um, three new forest health specialists. So Eric Otto is based out of Grand Rapids. Megan O'Neill is based out of Bemidji and Rachel Nickel is based out of Brainerd. So we're having our first team meeting this week and uh, we're super pumped to have them. So I'm sure we will all work with them in the near future. Okay, so maybe half or maybe even a little bit more of this talk is based off of our annual forest health aerial survey. So funding from this survey comes from the US Forest Service and the DNR flies most of Minnesota that the, the survey transects that we've flown are in the orange and the survey transects that the US Forest Service flies are in the green. And um, so we, the Forest Health team actually contracts out to an uh, internal DNR unit called Resource Assessment. So I'd just like to give them a shout out because they've spent most of the hours in the plane. And you can see in general up north, we fly six mile flight lines um, to cover the big uh, outbreaks that you can see for long distances up there. And then down south, um, it's it's harder to fly. There are more. It's harder to survey. There are more species, and um, we're we're trying to do some early detection. So there's some really tight knit flight lines in the middle of Morrison County. There, those are like one mile flight lines, and then in the southeast, we're really trying to get a hold of what Emerald Ash Borer is doing to the landscape. And if you look at this, all of these lines are nice and straight, except for that crazy line in southeast Minnesota, and that's the one that I flew, <laughs> which kind of describes to you how my brain feels trying to put this talk together. Um, 
a little bit on our website. If you go, if you just Google like Minnesota DNR Forest Health, you'll get to our home page, which is the grayed out image in the middle there. And if you scroll to the very bottom, you can sign up for our updates. So last year we put out about three newsletters um, telling you what we're seeing out there. Um, we've, we updated at least three uh, of our kind of categories on our website this year. We added a Baroque Blight website or web set of web pages. Um, we, re we revised our Oakwalt website, a lot of new material there. Um, and then actually our web people tell us that this uh, spruce problem diagnosis, it used to be a, like a PowerPoint or a PDF that you could go to. It was like our most powerful or our most popular click off of our Forest Health website. So they forced us to update it, which was a good thing. And now it's updated, easier to use format. Okay, on to Forest Health stuff. So my first section is my good news section. Good news, Forest Tent Caterpillar barely was uh, a blip on the radar this year, relatively speaking. I think we mapped like 28,000 acres that were affected by Forest Tent Caterpillar and that's roughly as low as Forest Tent Caterpillar gets in Minnesota in terms of presence out there on the landscape. Um, and that, and that those 28,000 acres were comprised of very small areas scattered throughout the northern half of Minnesota. Um, you can see our most recent outbreak peaked in 2013. Um, if you go back a little farther, that pales in comparison to our outbreak of um, that centered around 2002-2003. Um, and so if I were to give you a prediction, I would predict that the next time we see very large populations of forest tent caterpillar will be in 2023 to 2029. And maybe we'll be able to see some smashed caterpillars on highways like um, my my former teammates Mike and Jana Albers did during the last outbreak where all that black you see on the shoulder and in the middle that's all squished forest tent caterpillar carcasses. So this is a really impressive native defoliator of hardwood trees. Um, what's pretty fascinating to me about forest tent caterpillar is, is the small size relatively speaking of the outbreak that peaked in 2013. Most of that affected forest wouldn't have even been visible to most people. It was just really light defoliation. Um, and when you compare it to the peaks in like 2002, 1990, 1979, 1952, it's really a lot less than in those years. And I don't have a good answer why. Okay, the next pest, jack pine bobburn, it's another native caterpillar. It's, it's the main insect enemy of, of jack pine in our state. And it had a very tiny outbreak in central Minnesota, west central Minnesota that peaked in somewhere around 2016. Um, and that crashed too in 2018. Hardly any, there was, there was a couple very small jack pine forests in like central Minnesota, Cascadina County um, that had really light defoliation, but we barely saw any jack pine bubble, which was great news. Um, again, similar to the pattern with forest tank caterpillar outbreaks, it paled in comparison to the previous outbreak, which makes you really wonder if that's related. You'd maybe guess so um, if you were to bet on it. Um, this is just another uh, uh, photograph that the DNR took at the peak of the outbreak, and this was taken over Camp Ripley. All those brown trees were defo heavily defoliated jack pines. But in this last outbreak, again, you can see how small it is in comparison to the previous outbreak. A prediction would be that jack pine budworm populations will, will be highly noticeable again in about 10 years, well, 2025. It, it's jack pine, the, the, the time between outbreaks in central and west central Minnesota between jack pine outbreak populations, jack pine budworm yeah, outbreaks is about eight to 10 years. Pretty reliable. Okay, more good news. Baroque blight was hardly noticeable in central and northern Minnesota in 2018. 
Um, in fact, I got no calls, no complaints about Baroque blight. I, I did, um, I do do some severity surveys and there is about 0% severity of Baroque blight in central Minnesota. Um, Baroque blight, I forgot to mention this, it's a native pathogen of leaves, of Baroques only, and the characteristic symptoms is, is the V-shaped brown area that shows up on affected bur in infected Baroques. Those usually show up in late summer, early autumn. Um, what's really interesting is, is we had a relatively late leaf out period this spring. We had one of the coldest, I think it was the fourth coldest April on record in the Twin Cities anyways, and throughout most of Minnesota it was very cold April. Um, so presumably leaf out was a little later. Leaf out occurred in May. May got really hot. And when you take a look at the precipitation in May, this map shows precipitation um, difference from normal. So basically the oranges and the browns represent um, lower than normal precipitation. Green areas represent higher than normal precipitation in May. You can see that the far southern part of Minnesota had a ton of precipitation. That was the only place where Baroque blight symptoms were really noticeable on the landscape or the DNR received complaints about Baroque blight. Um, this seems to indicate that you only need one dry period during leaf out to knock back Baroque blight on individual Baroques that sustain Baroque blight year after year after year. It's pretty fascinating. Um, from what I've seen and um, from what actually my predecessor twice removed has documented, Baroque blights that are healthy can tolerate many, many consecutive years of very heavy uh, bur oak blight. Did I say bur oak blight? Anyways, bur oak trees can tolerate this disease for many consecutive years in a row. Um, okay, that brings us to our next section. Are there any questions out there online in the room? Not seeing any questions online, but if you do have them, uh, feel free to type them in the chat area uh, and send them to all panelists, uh, and then we'll be able to read them to Brian. Okay. All right, moving on to the surprising section. Not predictable the previous year section. So in the south, southeastern third of Minnesota, there was an event in the spring that we would call extreme winter drying on conifers. And what it did was conifers in May in the, the counties in gray there, not all the conifers, probably a low percentage of the conifers when you take a look at them, but there were widely scattered young conifers that just died in May, completely died. And this was a result of a, a phenomenon called winter drying. Some people call it winter desiccation. Some people call it winter injury. Um, so what happened is, like I said, April was very cold. Um, the ground was still frozen in late April, but in late April, we had a couple days or three days where relative humidities got down. In some instances, I saw below 20%, which is bone dry. Um, temperatures were in the 80s and wind gusts in many locations exceeded 40 miles an hour. Conifers started losing moisture from their leaves and they couldn't get it from the ground. And so they, they died from lack of water. Um, now, report, I, I did receive reports from farther north that also reported winter injury, but I'm not aware of widespread death on young conifers up north. It, it just occurred in, the, in those grayed out counties. Um, just in general, to identify winter injury, what happens is that needles will brown kind of suddenly in early spring, and branches, but branches underneath the, the would have been snow line remain green. And also the branches that turn brown tend to be on the south or southwest side facing the sun. Now this is, this is kind of textbook winter injury. This is not exactly what happened in southern Minnesota in 2018. The trees actually died. All the branches around the entire circumference of the tree um, either died or in the case of like Black Hill spruce, the needles like just dropped off the tree in, in the span of about two weeks. It was really shocking and just from the reports i got and from what i saw the trees that were seemed to be most heavily impacted were those that were planted 
in 2017, later 2017, where the trees were really young. Um, I did, you know, this past November, December, I was in southeastern Minnesota, and I noticed that a lot of people still had their their rows of dead arborvitae, and I would just recommend there is a native bark beetle that is present in in southern Minnesota called the, it's a common name of it is a cedar bark beetle, and some of those arborvitae did have those bark beetles in them, so I would just recommend making sure to get rid of those trees before the following, before April 2019. Okay, on to the biggest and most interesting story of 2018, for sure. I'm not even including the most interesting story um, in this presentation. I think it was because it, was, it only occurred on three trees, but read our last newsletter if you want to read about bloody aspens. It's pretty phenomenal. Okay, bur oaks, widely scattered bur oaks, basically in the Anoka Sand Plain, north of the Twin Cities, they didn't leaf out in May. This story started by a couple landowners calling me. They were pretty frantic, saying, the white oaks in my yard aren't leafing out, or the bur oaks. And that is very unusual, because if, for example, a, a, uh, an, a, wor a bur oak is infected with, like, say, oak wilt or two-line chestnut borer, it just doesn't completely die the following spring. So I was a little leery, but I went out to these properties and sure enough, their trees were completely dead. Okay, before I go on though, a note, just a, a mention on this map. Okay, this, this picture of this wasp on the needle is a giveaway. That's probably maybe is what I'm gonna end up talking about. I'll just say that these counties in the gray are where I saw evidence of this wasp. It's not, not um, I didn't necessarily see heavily, heavily impacted brokes throughout all these gray counties. It's just where this occurred to some degree, not necessarily severe. Anyways, so I went out to these properties in late May, and this is what I, I found. This um, big bur oak in the foreground there was, it looked dead. It looked dead even pretty close up to the tree. But I peeled back some bark on the twigs, and the cambium was still living. And so I kept my fingers crossed for this baroque and at the end of the summer this is what this baroque looked like and and this baroque actually looked like that actually at the end of june but you can if you look closely now this was the most severely impacted baroque i saw this was uh, northeast of cambridge a little ways um if you look around the periphery of this baroque there's dieback all around and i'll tell you that every single one of those Every single one of the leaves that you see on that tree came from an epicormic branch that grew within about a month from when I first visited the tree. Okay, here's another extreme example in that same area northeast of Cambridge, maybe 20 miles or so, um, where you know this tree produced a second canopy purely of epicormics. It's just phenomenal. And, and this tree barely had any, the, actually this is a group of like three bur oaks. They barely had any dieback at the end of June. It's just phenomenal. So when I looked at the affected twigs really closely, what really jumped out at me was these tiny exit holes all over, in insect emergence holes, only on twigs that were less than a half inch in diameter. And when I peeled back the bark, there were insect chambers just kind of peppering the inside of, the, of these twigs. Um, so just kind of a little review here, just a small, a very small percentage of widely scattered bur oaks had these really severe symptoms. Only small twigs were impacted. And I collected a lot, I, a lot of material and I reared out a lot of wasps. Now I'm definitely no wasp expert. And so I consulted with the US Forest Service and we identified a lab at the Smithsonian. They're called the USDA Systematic Entomology Lab, and they have a hymenopteran unit. And these, a lot, of, we sent a lot of these wasps to them. And eventually, they said that the majority of the wasps we sent them were this in this genus called Seropteres. Seropteres are wasps. They're in this family called Cynip, Cynipidae, Cynipid wasps. 
And this specific genus is known to inhabit the galls of other cynipid wasps, which was kind of disappointing because <laughs> presumably that means that all these that means that all these chambers we, we found in late May 2018 were actually not the chambers of the wasps that we reared, but the chambers of a different wasp yet to be identified. Yes, question. I want to comment. I, I, I don't have exact numbers for you on this, but I feel like two years ago, I was seeing those holes on twigs where there were also a lot of bullet galls, rough bullet galls. And then in 2018, I was seeing the holes, the exit holes without the bullet galls. So in 2017, I was thinking there was a connection between the bullet galls and the little tiny one millimeter-ish exit holes, but I didn't explore it enough. So maybe there is a relationship. I don't really know. I just want to comment that. Interesting. So just, just in case the online crowd didn't hear that, we have representatives here from University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic, and they said that last year or the year before, 20, 2017, 2017 they, they saw a possible association with rough bullet galls and some of these exit holes that I, showed, I recently showed photographs of. And, and, the, and then this year they also got samples with the exit holes, but no bullet galls. And so this just, I think, uh, illustrates a little more about this family of wasps called cynipid wasps. I think there are 800 known species of cynipid wasps, 700 of which infest oak. And a huge percentage of those cynipid wasps create galls on oaks ranging from little woody, like bullet, what we call bullet galls on twigs to like soft fuzzy galls on leaves. Um, actually, I, and I didn't say this before, but I saw a, a young plantation of Baroques in 2016 or 2015 in Goodhue County, southeast of the Twin Cities, that had this dieback in these exit hall, holes. And at that time, um, we weren't able to capture any causal organisms associated with those holes. So in a way, I was happy to see this outbreak in 2018 because at least we, we found out, okay, so there's these certain wasps that are associated with these, this problem. Um, another thing going back to what um, the disease clinic just mentioned is that North Dakota and Wisconsin have reported previously, and Minnesota, a similar outbreak of a cynipid wasp on swamp white oak. Um, and possibly other oaks, I, I don't recall exactly, but that wasp tended to infest larger diameter material and birds would hammer that material and just kind of debark twigs and everything. And that's not what we saw here. I think we think, at this point, we think it's different. But just to clear up this massive confusion that I've just started, a lot of talking, no pictures. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'll just throw up all the conclusions here. Basically, we have more work to do in 2019. We think that maybe we missed the window of time where we could actually capture the, the true cause of, of, the, of creating these chambers in Baroque. We're keeping our fingers crossed that we're actually going to be able to capture wasps before Baroque's leaf out in 2019, but that's what we're going to try. What we do know is that these twigs were loaded with these Seropteries wasps. It's probable that these Seropteries wasps were inhabiting the, the chamber of the true cause. And we found quite a few um, parasitic wasps that are known to, to parasitize cynipid wasps which is good news because that strongly indicates this is a native issue that we've just never documented before in the upper Midwest. So to be continued in 2019, and I hope it's not as confusing then. Okay, on to the next kind of, kind of surprise. This is an image that um, our aerial surveyor took in flight uh, in 2017, he sent this picture out to all the forest health specialists and we were like, wow, we should know what's going on there. Um, what's going on there? We didn't know. We, and so eventually we found out, well, these are, these are northern white cedars. Something's going on with the northern white cedars. And at that time, my previous teammate, 
had a tentative diagnosis that this was a shoot blade. There were some fruiting bodies on, on these. But in early 2018, she submitted samples to the Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic, and they found that, oh, well, th there's, there's no shoot blight here, but there are these very tiny caterpillars that are mining these white cedar needles. And so in, um, later then in 2018, I had some foresters go out to some of these affected stands, and they confirmed that, yes, indeed, all these northern white cedars had it strong, well, they had, they had been infested or they had their needles mined by some organism. That organism is a arborvitae leaf miner. Now, there are about three or four species of arborvitae leaf miner that it could be. We don't have a species confirmed on this. We just know it's arborvitae leaf miner. It has been observed in northern Minnesota over the eons, or I should say over the decades. Last year, we had about 12,000 acres of damage. This year, we confirmed 4,000 acres of damage, possibly an additional 14,000 acres of damage. Why the huge range of, of potential air? It's because we have another leaf miner on another swamp conifer species, tamarack, the, the um, large case bear, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And from the air, they look maybe, maybe identical. From, from 1,000 feet above the ground going 100 miles an hour. So it's tough to distinguish this. But this map shows you, you know, the arborvitae leaf miner is heavily, the damage heavily concentrated in southeast Itasca County, basically southern Itasca. Um, the damage when the foresters went out there to ground truth, our, our flight, it wasn't really concerning. Um, usually the, the trees had over 50% of the canopy green that they should have had. You can see in the picture there on your left that little tiny hole. These critters are super small. Um, and so indications of them just are their frass, which is almost like a dust that falls out of these brown leaves, and then these exit holes. And that's how you can confirm arborvitae leaf miner. Um, the, you know, why were we confused in 2017? It's actually this, this insect has kind of a weird life cycle where you can't really find the insect the year that it actually that it infests the white cedar. You can't really confirm it until the following spring. So when we were flying over these massive white cedar um, wetland complexes in 2017, they're on the ground. It would have been very difficult to see the organism. We were we couldn't see it until 2018. So that's why we had this delayed diagnosis. Okay, here's a. Uh, really unfortunate thing that came to came to my attention in in 2018 uh, uh, DNR parks state park employee reported that Brian the forests at nurse strand state park are dying what's going on so I went out there and and nurse strand is south of the Twin Cities like northeast of Faribault in Rice County and all of the tree species we're dying. Um, so we're talking northern red oaks, sugar maples, hackberries, American elms, green ash. All, all of the mature trees were dying. And so when you have multiple trees showing the same symptoms, that's a strong indicator of some environmental cause of the problem, not like an insect or a disease. And in this case, it's, it's excessive precipitation in over the long term. What we and what's really concerning specifically about Nurse Strand is that the understory is just pure green ash. So the forest was kind of naturally converting to a more tolerant forest type of wet conditions. But unfortunately, because of the presence of emerald ash borer at some point in the state park, that's not really a sustainable forest situation. So we're working on that. From the air, this is what it looks like. It's about 200 acres. All those, all the the gray trees, that's, those are, the cover type is central hardwood. And it's, it's been dying since, according to aerial imagery, since about 2014, 2015. This graph shows the growing season precipitation at Nurse Strand State Park from eight, so that's April through September from 2008 on your left to 2018. So a 10-year snapshot of how much rain this park has received during the growing season in relation to the average from 1895 to 1990. So that average is that purple line at the bottom. So you can see 
the average from 1895 to 1990 for the growing season was about 22 inches per year. And we're, we're talking from, you know, the last 10 years, maybe an average of like 25 inches a year or 24. So this park is getting a lot more rain during the growing season. Um, Kenny Bloomfeld, the, the state climatologist, reported to me that the, the number of one inch plus rain events during the growing season at this state park is up 50% for the last decade or so relative to the, to the long-term average. Um, and then of course, you know, the affected, there, there's more to it than just that. I mean, the affected forests are growing on really flat, poorly drained soils. There might be a hard pan of clay limiting, limiting water percolation. So it's just a sad story. I'm not aware of large areas in Southeast Minnesota that are also showing this, maybe possibly smaller areas. Um, I also looked though, this is just nurse strand. I looked at all the surrounding counties. I looked at Southeast Minnesota Climate Division, South Central Minnesota Climate Division, and then the whole state. All of the growing season precipitation mirrors what nurse strand is experiencing, although nurse strand is a little bit, is exaggerated all over all those other geographies. So Minnesota in the spring has gotten wetter. This is this is the next issue that was not predictable. It's um, I, the U.S. Forest Service entomologist Steve Katovich let me know about this issue. There's this really tiny um, sucking insect called an adelgid, specifically pine leaf adelgid, that is affecting some scattered white pine in in this area of the northern of the Arrowhead. And what happens is when these when these white pines become infested, they kind of get wilty. And sometimes their shoots turn brown. So you can see that wilty appearance in, in, in the middle of that photograph of that white pine. I dealt with it with a, a similar outbreak of this in northern Wisconsin maybe a decade ago, and it, the outbreak lasted about three years. Um, in, in, in the fall, this adelgid just looks like pepper flakes on, on these wilty shoots. So I there's that light blue circle there on the right that circles these, they're almost purple specks, just really tiny critters. They have a white fringe. And the following spring, they kind of puff up into fuzzy purple balls, like you can see on that white pine shoot. Um, <clears throat> so my experience is that, yeah, you, you can get some white pine saplings actually dying from this. That's pretty rare. Um, but but Christmas tree plantation growers, it kind of gives them a headache. Um, so that's something that Christmas tree growers should watch out for if they're growing white pines in, in that area. I don't know if that occurs up in the Arrowhead or not, if they grow white pines for Christmas trees, but it's something to watch out for. Something else that happened in 2018 was super intensive seed crops on a whole bunch of trees. This is a picture of an ash um, all that brown that you see there are seeds, and I, I think I've seen recently some ash still have maintained their seeds. Um, this was at um, Sibley State Park in Candy Yohai County, kind of in west central Minnesota. Um, but here's a list that I kept track of this year of other trees that produced intensive seed crops. Actually, during our aerial surveys in, over southeast Minnesota, our aerial surveyor um, documented what he thought, what it looked like, kind of widespread mortality of an unknown hardwood species. And when I would ground truth these sites, it was all, they were all box elders. They were all living. They just had really thin crowns. This is a picture of in Pine County of, of a red maple. So when we're flying over these areas of that, that have a lot of red maple, it looks like forest and caterpillar defoliation, but it's not. It's, it's a lot of just scant leaf production on these trees. Um, what can this do? Well, it can cause minor dieback on some tree species. I've seen that the picture on your left there is ash. And you can see that it's lost some, some leaves on, in its lower canopy. Ash lots of times produces more seed in its lower canopy. This picture on your right, I believe that's an elm. So you can see maybe the following year, you're gonna see some dieback in the, on the upper right part of that canopy. Not a big deal. I don't know why it happened seemed like all these tree species, some, some environmental factor must have cued in these, these tree species to do this, but I don't know what that was. 
Any questions on the surprising section? Well, Brian, we got a couple of questions from the first section. Sure. Um, going back to Burr Oak Light, um, there was a question on how susceptible young trees are to Burr Oak Light. Uh, so thinking, trying to regenerate a stand with young Burr Oak trees. Great question. Uh, how susceptible are, bur are young Burr Oaks to Burr Oak Light? We have a lot of experts in the audience, so I'd prefer to pull them. Uh, uh, first, I'll share my experience. My experience is that bur oaks in the understory, now they may or may not be younger than the overstory, they, I've, I've seen it rarely on them. My, from what I've seen, it seems that stressed bur oaks that are older are more susceptible to bur oak blight. I have seen bur oak blight on young trees I can't think of any seedling baroques that I've seen baroque blight on. I'm not too concerned with baroque blight and the future of baroques in the state. But what about the other experts in the room? What do you think? Have you ever seen baroque blight on younger saplings, vigorous trees? Often on young trees, I feel like there's really good air circulation around those trees. There's a lot of light penetration, so the canopy's just not that big. Um, whereas on the older trees, you really see it first in those kind of more shaded inner parts of the canopy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suspect, I know some of the work um, that was done originally with Burr Oak Light, they were looking, they were inoculating young trees in uh, greenhouse conditions. So I, I don't know that there's true resistance, but I, I think the environmental conditions of having a smaller canopy with better light penetration and just more open air circulation through there might help the, the younger trees because I, I have not seen yeah. really young burrs with bur oak blight. Interesting um, point. It's the older ones that I, and you, uh, in the lower inner canopy where you really start to see it first. Interesting. So so maybe the environmental conditions for the disease aren't, aren't appropriate generally around young bur oaks. Yeah. Depending on how they're planted. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank, uh, thanks to Michelle Grabowski, too, for that answer. <laughs> uh, another question is kind of trying to predict the next outbreaks. So you mentioned for forest and caterpillar and jack pine budworm, uh, you're predicting the outbreaks 2025 to 2029-ish. Um, a different interpretation of the data shown is that outbreaks are on the same 8 to 10 year cycle, but much smaller than in the 2001 to 2005 period. So I guess a comment about trying to predict the next cycle of forest and caterpillar and jack pine budworm. Is there a question there? <laughs> well, I think it's, it's, so how do you kind of make that prediction for the next outbreak? The, so first of all, something I've learned is that humans love predictions and they don't often follow up to see if those predictions are right. <laughs> so I'm not too scared about making predictions. And the, 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 information I'm, the information I'm basing those predictions off of are just the historical um, cyclical nature of outbreaks in Minnesota. I mean, with forest scent caterpillar, it's going back to 37, I think, 1937, it's been um, 15 years at the most between outbreaks, between peak years and outbreaks, and I forget the minimum. But I think it might be 10 years. And so that's that's how I came up with the prediction for forest tent caterpillar and likewise for jack pine budworm. Actually, my, my predecessor uh, up north or my former teammate, Jana Albers, did some great work along with some, some university researchers. I'm not sure who they were looking at the different outbreak cycles of jack pine in different parts of Minnesota. So they found that in, in central Minnesota, kind of maybe centered around um, like the Brainerd area, the, the, the years between outbreaks in that area of the state are eight years. Further northwest, the, the period between outbreaks are 10 years. And then there's, there's a bunch of, of jack pine in, in northeastern Minnesota. And I, the outbreak cycle between, between outbreaks in far northeastern Minnesota is 24 years, I believe. Something It's much longer in northeastern Minnesota. So I was just talking about central Minnesota looking at the, out, the, the historical outbreak nature there. But I want, I'll, I'll just give you a prediction of when I think this is probably gonna occur, but not like the severity of it all. 
Yep. Okay. On to the predictable section. So every year I talk about spruce budworm, and this year is no exception. This area in kind of well, western Lake County in, the, in Minnesota's Arrowhead has sustained defoliation from spruce budworm since 2014. Some areas there in, in kind of that, well, bordering St. Louis County and Lake County in, in the far northwest part of Lake County, they actually have sustained budworm damage for much longer. And I'll show you maps in a little bit here to, sh to show you that. But spruce budworm, it's, it's a native defoliating caterpillar. It prefers balsam fir. It will also really go after white spruce. And, and, and then there's actually several more conifers that it'll occasionally chew on, but it really likes balsam fir. And what it does is it produces a lot of silk. It lots of times twists together new shoots. You'll see defoliation typically at the end of June, early July. Um, and so, like I said, this is the fourth year of defoliation in, in this area. Balsam fir, they, they don't start dying from being defoliated by spruce budworm until they've been significant, like um, heavily defoliated, their new shoots heavily defoliated for three to five consecutive years. That's when you'll start seeing top death and trees start to die. Outbreaks might last eight years, um, and then you'll, you'll continue to see fur die for three to four years after those outbreaks. So here's just kind of a time series of the current, the, the, this, this current area, like what, it, what it's looked like over the years. So this is 2014. These are the areas we mapped that were affected by spruce budworm. Here's 2014 and 15. The darker the areas, the more times it's been repeatedly defoliated. 2014, 2016, 2014, 2017, 2014, and 2018. So you can see that area southeast of Ely has been hit really hard. Um, and then if you put, to, put the, the area that was previously defoliated, you can see there are small areas in far northwestern Lake County that have sustained defoliation for well over five years. Um, and so this picture shows you what these forests heavy to fur eventually look like after they sustained many consecutive years of defoliation. Again, I'll make another prediction here. We will see spruce budworm defoliation again in the Arrowhead in 2019. Because, why? It's because we've mapped it since at least 1954. There's, there's always seems to be some active spruce budworm going on in Minnesota's Arrowhead. Um, and just a very, very general comment to lessen the impact of budworm in the future, you can diversify tree species. Um, there, you know, the, the more balsam fir a, stand, a forest has, the higher the risk of impact from spruce budworm. Um, there, and I've, you know, I don't work up in northern Minnesota, but I, I am aware of some pretty cool, uh, pretty cool prop stories where where private properties have gotten cost share from, you know, the local SWCD or the, the local um, DNR Forester through our PFM program, Private Forest Management Program, and they've gotten cost share to diversify um, a stand by planting. A variety of, of trees appropriate for the site and then protecting them from deer browse to try and lessen the impact of budworm in the future and also to try and clean up some of that dead and dying fur to lessen the impact of wildfire so there's some good work being done up there that i'm aware of okay another very reliable defoliator in minnesota is the large case bear. i briefly mentioned this before when i was talking about arborvitae leaf miner this too is a a leaf mining uh, a needle mining tiny caterpillar. This, unlike the arborvitae leaf miners, though, we know that this is not a native species. Um, you can see we've mapped some, you know, tens of thousands of acres of, of, of forests impacted by large case bears since 2000. It's very consistent. Um, this image in the upper right shows the case of the large case bear. This is a pretty cool critter. It, it'll, it'll snip off some young uh, tamarack needles and kind of tie them together and then use that as a tube strip, a tube house from which to to suck on other tamarack needles. And you can see these in the winter time too, just stuck on these tamarack buds. Um, so this map on your right, the blue areas show show the areas where we mapped that were impacted to some degree by large case bear 
in 2018. Now here I, I put this statement. Now this is really a question I have. What is the impact of large case bear? I don't think anyone knows. It seems negligible because when you take a look at the areas that we've mapped over, over the years affected by large case bear, lots of times an area maybe only be affected once one year, maybe two years in a row. And, and then you, you look at if there's any follow-up mortality that we've mapped in that area, and, and I don't think there are many examples of that. The really complicating factor, though, in Minnesota is the presence of large beetle outbreak. And so, you know, if, if, we're, if we're surveying over an area and it's impacted and we're seeing mortality from large beetle and we're also seeing maybe a little bit of residual defoliation from case bear, we probably err on the side of, of marking that mortality caused by large beetle. And that probably is truly what's going on. Large beetle is definitely the, the major player when it comes to tamarack health in Minnesota today. Um, but I just wanted to, to put that out there that it's a question I have and large beetle is a complicating factor. So on to large beetle outbreak. You've experienced a large beetle outbreak in Minnesota since 2001. I was really unoriginal with this slide. This is the same exact slide I showed last year. Sorry if you're bored. You know, it's it's a native bark beetle. It's really small. The image on your left is kind of is, shows an image of Minnesota, um, and so we've lost huge tracts of tamarack in our state um, to this critter. The pink areas in this map are, are are showing where we mapped large beetle damage in 2018. They overlay black areas that were already affected. So you can see northwestern Minnesota has been has lost a lot of tamarack. Um, University of Minnesota has has done some really great work showing that warming climate is a longer growing season. Maybe um, less severe cold winters are helping this pop this insect's population to grow. Um, so the big question that, and, and a lot of this land is on state managed, a lot of this affected forest is on state managed land, and it's just an enormous challenge to deal with. There are very poor markets for tamarack. Tamarack is not worth a lot of money. There's not a lot of places to sell tamarack. Not many people are interested in it. Um, these sites are very difficult to access. You, loggers can't access them every year because sometimes the, these these bogs aren't freezing down solid for their to to hold up their equipment. It's a big challenge. We have tried to increase the the amount of tamarack sands that we're putting up for timber sale every year in order to try and salvage some. And actually, um, the DNR Silviculture Program and University of Minnesota are partnering and they've written a grant proposal to try and assess the, the level of natural regeneration that's occurring in some of these affected areas. Because all of this, um, all of these areas, this is, this is just adds to the workload of DNR foresters who already have a whole um, list of targets to meet for the year for you know, examining re successful regeneration on all of our other properties. So this is just extra. We, we can't come close to looking at all of it. And so that's why they've written this grant to try and try and get some good answers on what's happening in these stands naturally. Okay, again, I suspect we're gonna continue to see large beetle um, population, the, the impact of large beetle increase for who knows how long? I mean, there's no indication really that it's that it's shrinking. You can see that from 2017 to 2018, the amount of acres affected that we mapped was smaller than the record acreage that we mapped from 2016 to 2017. But I don't. I, there's no trend here that I don't think that we can that we can glean. 45% of Minnesota's tamarack has been impacted by this outbreak to some degree or another. Emerald ash borer. Um, so these are the, now a lot of this data comes from Minnesota Department of Ag. Minnesota Department of Ag is the lead agency when it comes to dealing with emerald ash borer. The blue, bluish triangles that I placed on this map were, were newly confirmed infested trees in 2018. You can see, like in, if you look at Southeast Minnesota, the two far southeasternmost counties, Winona and Houston, a lot, 
we, we don't feel the need to continuously report newly infested trees in those counties. We know that it, there's widespread infestation. So the focus has been on mapping where we're, where we're finding new infestations. Um, take note of, if you go northwest of the Twin Cities EAB disaster there, if you go to the, north, the northern tip of Wright County, that was the big news in 2018. That's Clearwater, um, right on, right off of Interstate 94, off of an exit off of 94, and Emerald Ash Borer was found there for the first time in 2018. The Yellow County here, that's newly quarantined county in 2018, that's Wright County. Um, I suspect that's really close to the Mississippi River. I suspect that county is that that local quarantine is going to expand to surrounding counties sooner than later. I would think. Um, I, I know Minnesota Department of Ag does plan to do some delimitation surveys, so trying to figure out how far Emerald Ash Borer has expanded outside of Clearwater, if it has. And then, of course, the gray counties are were counties that were already quarantined for Emerald Ash Borer. Um, now. Every other year or every third year, I'm trying to get a hold of what the forests look like in the affected area. And here this map shows that. I kept on confirmed infested trees, but um, you know those are individual trees. So those are the black points. The red polygons are uh, a uh, summation of the, the polygons that we mapped as affected forests by Emerald Ash Borer from in 2016 survey and in the 2018 survey. So we've mapped over 5,600 acres of forest. I guess the take home point from this slide is that this is occurring in a landscape that is dominated by farm fields and oaks. So there's not a lot of ash down there. Um, you can see, so the darker the red, um, the heavier the impact to that individual forest. So you can see that that moderate category, which means 30 to 50% of the trees in that polygon are affected. There aren't many of those. Why? It's because Ash isn't very common down there, relatively speaking. However, if you were to buffer all of those infested trees by a half mile in, in, and buffer our aerial survey polygons by a half mile, we can see that over 200,000 acres of land is, is, most, is almost certainly infested or threatened by emerald ash borer. Um, now again, the grand majority of that land base is farm field, um, hardwood forest, and urban, an urban situation, okay? I just decided to be lazy here. <laughs> this, this talk is so full. I mean, geez, I'm supposed to be done right now, right? I don't know. Um, but suffice to say, if you want, our DNR's forest health take on what to do about Emerald Ash Borer, just check out our EAB pages. Wow, I am talking so slowly today. Let's, um, let's skip this page. This is where, Emerald, where we've confirmed oak wilt, okay? But I just kind of want to talk about what we're doing about oak wilt. So Morrison County SWCD got LCCMR approved for a grant for $100,000 to try and put the kibosh on oak wilt at the oak wilt's leading northwest edge in Minnesota. If you look at all the oak forests north of this zone that's boxed, there are lots of oaks, right? So if we can put, if we can suppress oak wilt in this area, I think we're doing a lot of good. That's pending legislative and governor approval, but keep your fingers crossed, I think that's gonna happen. We have tried to suppress oak wilt in, in St. Croix State Park, and we're, we're doing a good job, we're battling oak wilt um, we're battling fewer mortality centers in that, in that state park over the years. Hopefully that trend will continue. The DNR has advised all these property owners are on eradication for oak wilt. So oak wilt has been eradicated, or I shouldn't say eradicated. Oak wilt has been controlled on those properties. We can't truly say it's been eradicated until we've monitored that site for five years. And then we're looking at some alternative controls in, in Minnesota because it's actually, when you take a look at the state, not everyone can get a vibratory plow. They're actually quite rare in the state. Okay, this is the last topic. Jack, Japanese beetle outbreak continued in the Twin Cities area, but it, in some areas, it was less so in 2017, or in 2018. So hopefully that will stop and I am done. <laughs> so that's the whirlwind tour of, of what we saw in Forest Health.
in 2018. Well, a very interesting question from Cloquet. Um, how would you characterize the overall health or fitness level of our forests? Are we an Olympic athlete, a middle-aged person with a few extra pounds in ICU? Uh, and are there foresters that things that foresters should do to promote overall forest fitness? <laughs> <laughs> I could guess who asked that question. Um, I, honestly, like forest health, I don't like the term forest health, but that's what I have to live with. Forest health has so much more to do than just um, things that kill trees, like insects and diseases. Um, it, it also obviously has a lot to do with the presence of invasive plants in the landscape and um, you know, the diversity of, of, of the forest itself. And I just don't think I have the authority to, to answer that question. And the other thing is I tend to be pessimistic when it comes to my view on the environment. And I don't want to bring everyone down. <laughs> Certainly there are healthy forests in Minnesota, really healthy forests in some parts of Minnesota. Yep. Um, and then the, the other question was what can people do to promote healthy forests. Again, I, I suspect the person that asked that question can answer that question better than I can. And I'm sure I know a lot of foresters can answer that question better than I can too. You know, my, my big shtick is saying diversity, diver, diversifying species, I think, that are appropriate for the site is perhaps the best thing we can do while paying attention to the presence of invasive plants and what they're doing on the landscape. Yeah, are there any are there any plans to deal with the central hardwood death from excess precipitation at Nurse Strand State Park? Yes, there's actually a kind of a multidisciplinary team, multi-agency team that's that has met and um, I'm kind of on the outskirts of that team, but I, I think they're gonna do some really some I think they're going to be looking into what are appropriate species for the future at that at that state park. And so just my little role in that, along with the US Forest Services, I'm aware of some elm seeds that have been harvested from, from known um, Dutch elm disease tolerant parents that the US Forest Service has. If the state park is open to the, to the idea of planting those out in certain areas of the state park to kind of promote a forest that is, is more tolerant of wet conditions, they, they're, they're going to consider that with a monitoring aspect to it. Is farm drainage part of the problem? Is farm drainage a part of the problem at Nurse Strand State Park? I've wondered the same thing myself, and I don't know. But with the, with the change, and you know, I don't I don't know the specifics about all I know about tiling practices in in ag is that it has changed, and um, so I, I do wonder what the change in, in drainage practices on ag land, I wonder what the impact of forests is. Mm -hmm. uh, final question, what can we expect with 50 to 100 years from now from climate change? Man. And I should put a plug in for our next month's webinar, Kenny Blumenfeld will be talking about the Minnesota's change in climate. So. Whoever's asking these questions is giving me way more credit than they ought to. Um, again, I don't have the, there are so many smarter, more qualified people to answer these questions. Um, with climate change, um, I don't, you know, obviously I don't know. I do wonder though about things like, you know, our native slew of, of critters. Take Eastern large beetle as an example. Research has strongly indicated that is being, that was promoted at least in part by a changing climate. Baroque blight, pretty obvious that research that came out of Iowa State um, pretty strongly um, points to the fact that, yeah, that's that's uh, a syndrome of climate change. So I, when, when I see things like arborvitae leaf miner just blow up all of a sudden, 
every time I see kind of a new native, uh, a native critter that's all of a sudden appearing on the landscape in a large amount, I, I always wonder, is this the next eastern large beetle? Is this the next burrow blade? You would expect that we would start to see more. And so, you know, in, in 50 to 100 years, I mean, are we, I'm actually, in terms of the forests, unlike the previous question, I am actually kind of positive for our forests in the state, you know, I think if, 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 uh, I think research is, is going in the right direction in Minnesota, looking at the impacts and how we can adapt to climate change. There's a lot of great work out there. Other questions? Any predictions, Brian, with forest and caterpillar and gypsy moth? Um, if that could increase that or what might be happening there in the future? The question is, um, what are my predictions with the interaction between gypsy moth and forest tent caterpillar? Maybe I'll skip that question and just say that for gypsy moth, if you take a look at the westward spread of gypsy moth towards southeast Minnesota, it looks like gypsy moth is going to get there around 2030. There's another prediction for you. Um, my experience in Wisconsin and seeing how gypsy moth is operated in the UP of Michigan suggests that in our northern forests that are dominated by aspen, gypsy moth is not going to have a large impact. Um, gypsy moth has not had a huge impact in, in northern Wisconsin, in the UP. It has big outbreaks. They, they quickly seem to crash due to biological control agents that kind of come along with gypsy moth populations. Um, and I think that, you know, the areas if we just use Wisconsin as a model, the areas in, in Minnesota that are going to suffer greatest due to gypsy moth are like dry um, pin oak type sites like the Anoka sand plain. In terms of interaction between forest and caterpillar and gypsy moth, we will see. Uh, I recently read something, I think, got these numbers right. It said 7% of U.S. forests might lose 20% of their species. And what you said about near Strand Park reminded me of that kind of statistic. Um, is there a second place for near Strand Park in Minnesota or are there other parts of Minnesota that are similarly concerning in terms of Species, species loss. loss. I mean, certainly, just like I mean, the thing that comes to mind is emerald ash borer and ash, and you know, and there are you know there are little pockets of pure black ash in southeast Minnesota, so those areas are certainly suffering. Sometimes you see um, like a forested stand in southeast Minnesota, typically along kind of a, a small stream in a in a narrow valley that's comprised of butternut, black ash, elm, and box elder. And so what you're, what those forests are reverting to is actually really unhealthy box elder that has a lot of dieback for some reason. So those little spots in Southeast Minnesota are losing diversity. Um, and then certainly when, when emerald ash borer gets going in kind of central Minnesota where there's a lot of black ash swamps, they're gonna be losing all kinds of diversity too. But I don't have a second place for you after Nurse Strand. Thank you, Brian. For Thank you. Um, I uh, just saw that Madison Rodman had sent uh, the links for continuing education credits. If you're interested in those, uh, do check those out. And then I did want to, we had talked about climate, um, and that's the focus of next month's webinar on. Minnesota's climate. Uh, so Kenny Blumenfeld with the Minnesota, uh, the state of Minnesota is going to be with us to talk about that. Uh, and that's on February 12th. And I think that's a week earlier than we normally are for these webinars. I think that's on the second Tuesday of the month, not the third Tuesday of the month. So a little bit earlier next month, uh, if you're interested in attending that. Uh, so with that, we'll sign off and uh, thanks for joining us, everyone.